pretty much increased our monthly charge rate by 3x in about a six month period. It wouldn't have been possible without these systems, these tools, you know, really focusing on how to be more execution free and doing everything we could to take ourselves out of the business. Meet Marcel Krosik, the founder of Little Jack Marketing. He and his wife, Gabby, have cracked the code for creating the 100% execution-free agency business model. Now, I'm about to interview Marcel to get his secrets of how he and his wife created a scalable, repeatable, and profitable system that eliminates in-house fulfillment work. Or as they like to describe it, they've made a lifestyle empire. Plus, they've built a frictionless sales process where high-quality prospects are auditioning to work with their agency. You heard that right. Leads are cold calling them. Marcel and Gabby have been living the dream, traveling the globe while focusing on clients and strategy, not deadlines. They have a core book of business generating up to $7,500 per month per client in recurring revenue and are on track to exceed $1 million in recurring revenue without handling any fulfillment. By the end of this video, you'll have their blueprint for success, including the tools, processes and mindset that can enable anyone to become a hands-off agency owner. Marcel is in fact going to demo a couple of the tools within his tech stack that he loves using. You'll also learn about the recurring revenue products and packages that print money for their agency. And you'll also learn about the sales funnel that's designed to attract high paying, high end clients. Now, before I jump into this interview, please give this video a like and subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell. Now, if we can get to 500 likes, Marcel and Gabby have agreed to share the AI prompts that allowed them to build a content machine for both their agency and their clients. I hope you enjoy this interview. Please also drop any questions that you have in the comments section below. Marcel and Gabby would be really happy to answer them. All right, Marcel Krosik, thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing? Uh, doing good. Uh, how about yourself? Uh, great. Thank you. All right. We'll just jump straight into it. So Marcel, can you tell me a bit about yourself and how you came up with this idea of a 100% execution-free agency business model? Uh, sure. So when I was you know, thinking about our business and where I want to take everything, including my life in general, I wanted to kind of build a lifestyle empire, more or less. Uh, I, was kind of, I heard someone mention it once. And I was like, that sounds really cool. How, how do we do that? And I remember uh, back in 2010, when I started the agency, at first, the reason we moved everything to being a remote agency was simply because uh, we wanted to save some cost and being remote was the easiest way to do it. It wasn't until I started traveling abroad or had the opportunity to go abroad in 2016 that I was like, hey, you know, we got to keep everything like this and keep building the business in a way that it's uh, not just fully remote, but removing myself from it as much as possible too, so that we can keep moving around, keep uh, you know going after these life experiences while also being able to service and uh, service our clients and provide value to them. Okay. So it really came from a place of um, having this lifestyle aspiration and having what you do for a living fit into that, right? It, yeah. And I'd say it wasn't, you know, it wasn't initially by design. Like I didn't have this grand plan. It was more little small steps, like getting a little taste of what it feels like to work remote, what it feels like to work, um, uh, you know, to, to travel and to get around. And they want to just keep building on that and just making, uh, you know, gain more uh, or doing more of those things and spend more of our time with, with that level of freedom uh, and flexibility. Um, so Marcel, you know, before we had this, uh, before we, before we were having this conversation, you, you mentioned um, this execution free agency was built in phases, right? And so you're mm. at the phase now where every, everything or practically almost everything is execution free. Um, walk us through what that's like now. And, and maybe you can talk through kind of like the, the structure of how things look like. What do you and Gabby do? Yeah. So what it's like now is I uh, definitely sleep better at night. That's for sure. Because I remember there was a period in time where I go to bed super stressed, would be thinking of work all night long, you know, till two, three in the morning or even working on projects till two, three in the morning. Now, uh, go back at a normal time, possibly even um, a bedtime that people would consider uh, too old for my age. Uh, so like we're wrapping up the day around eight, sometimes in bed by nine o'clock, but we're also up by, at 5 a.m. now. Um, so it's definitely been a lot more balanced between work and life, which is fantastic. Uh, as far as Gabby and I, so my, my wife and I, so she's the uh, essentially the chief operations officer, if I'm the CEO in this case. And we have a much more... Uh, clear distinction of our roles, which helps a lot with not just the business, but also with our relationship. We have our own domains that we're in control of. Um, and as, as you know, we were talking about some questions of 
uh, can I show you some things in the business? And it's actually been a long time since I even touched some of that stuff because it's uh, so clearly under her domain now of uh, operating and running the business. So that's helped a lot to uh, you know, reduce the stress of what do we do and what are we responsible for, uh, help with our personal relationships, but or relationship, but also allow us to move more quickly and more and be more productive with our time too in the business. Okay. And so you're, you both are mainly focusing on the strategy and looking after the clients, right? But the grunt work, and we'll get to that, is being performed by other things and people. Correct. Yeah. So my side is mostly strategy, business development, or like direct co- uh, one-to-one coaching with our clients. And then uh, Gabby's side is on the uh, managing the operations. So she helps vet the vendor. She keeps the vendors accountable. Uh, and we're constantly trying to make sure that if if she ever jumps in on something, that we're figuring out how do we take her out of that, that particular task. Uh, so like, for example, myself, I used to get involved in developing the websites or tweaking, you know, jumping in and doing some coding or even... Uh, you know, doing some graphic design in Photoshop. I haven't touched a website in two years now. I haven't even opened up the back end. And um, the other piece is uh, Photoshop. I used to do a bunch of design work. I just canceled my <laughs> Adobe subscription the other uh, a few months ago because I haven't. I realized I hadn't used it in almost a year and a half. I'm certain we have website agency owners watching this video right now asking, "How do I not build a website and offset <laughs> that task to someone else?" Okay. Yeah. So in running a 100% execution-free agency, does that ambition or does that model uh, determine what products you sell? So in in a 100% execution-free business model, how do you decide what to sell? Yeah, so so what we are always looking at is what are the problems? So it's, it's definitely a chicken and egg situation when you're talking about what is or who is your audience and what's the solution you're you're delivering. And so we're always trying to figure out, okay, well, who is it that we serve and and what are the problems that they need to solve? And we always start with the problem first before we look at at the tools. Um, And and then when we're doing that, we go, okay, what is the problem that they want solved right now? And you say a short term. So what do they want or what are they frustrated with that we could resolve in, say, uh, one day, seven days, 90 days? And then what's the long long term um, solution, you know, one plus years from now? And from there, that starts to give us some bumpers and, and uh, some guidelines of what we're looking at as far as now, what are the tools, what are the solutions we need to actually make that stuff happen. So can you walk us through what some of your top services or packages are that you sell to, to clients? What are the underlying products? Yeah, so what we so most clients come to us because they want some sort of tactic, you know, something that is tangible, something that they can point to. So that could be social media, it could be SEO, it could be ads, because they hear it, they see it, they, you know, experience it. But the real thing that they need is the results of those things. So the idea is, hey, we need to be able to deliver on something that they want. So we have SEO packages, we have ad packages, but what they are really looking for is how do we get the results that those things get? So we're constantly looking at a balance of going, hey, we're not just selling you social media, or ads, we need to also sell you the strategy because that stuff's only as strong as the messaging. So we got to actually, like they don't necessarily see the value in improving their messaging out the gate. They want that thing that they can point to. So it's like, if you want to sit down, you, you buy a chair, a chair is tangible. You can picture, you can imagine what it is. Ads, social media, and SEO are kind of the same thing. It's kind of like the, you know, helping them envision what is the bigger thing that they need. So we really focus on, okay, well, they want, SEO right now, that's a big piece of what we sell uh, right out the gates. But we need to start with the messaging and the strategy. So we're really piecing all those things together so that they're getting both what they want and need, both in the short term and in the long term. Okay. So it's not just the underlying products like SEO and, and paid ads and what have you. It's, actual, it's the actual consulting and the strategy that you sell. Correct. Yeah. So there's really three dimensions that we sell. It's coaching tools and done-for-you services. And that has really increased our long-term value for our clients and has allowed us to raise our rates drastically, especially for the value that we're providing. Because we can now deliver results for something in the short term, sometimes even as early as that very first meeting we have with them, we can get them some wins, help them you know, close more clients right away, but then get them on a path of something bigger. And we can start to stack these services together so that they're uh, constantly having wins uh, you know, right out the gates in those first 90 days, and then also you know, 12 months or you know, three years from now. Okay, you mentioned raising your rates drastically. That that sounds uh, that sounds like something a lot of our audience members might, might want to do. Uh, but what I what I want to get straight to is the tools that you're using to cultivate cultivate this um, 100% execution free business model. Can you, can you just 
maybe go through a list of what do you use? Cool. Yeah. So uh, as far as the tools go, the backbone of our operations, as far as the the execution side, things like the work that's actually done, whether it's social media, SEO, uh, content writing, that that goes through Vendasa and Vendasa's marketplace and their partners and vendors in there. And as far as what we have to run the business, it's um, it's a uh, everything from our VAs. We use a, a, a great company called Magic VA. Uh, our data and uh, information is all done through Notion. Our, our project management is through Teamwork. Uh, we use time tracking tools like Toggle, uh, mostly to help with awareness. So we make sure we're spending our time in the right spots uh, and, and, and to identify what is taking up time. Uh, not so much as, uh, say, you know, uh, like a project cost basis, more so for where are you know just to create awareness of where we're spending our time and what, what's like at that time then we have you know google workspaces you know calendar calendly for booking meetings uh i'd say 99 percent of the people i talk to all go through my calendar now i almost never schedule anything just you know off the cuff or, or via uh, email without them jumping right on the calendar uh, a huge tool that we adapt uh, adopted this year uh for meetings and note taking is Fathom. That's awesome for screen recordings, AI, uh, transcriptions, doing meeting closeouts. Uh, and then of course the big ones on automation, chat GPT and, and Zapier. Okay. So ev- from everything from content creation through to uh, note taking through to calendar booking, uh, uh, calendar bookings, you've got, you've got a tool that serves every part of that layer. Correct. Okay, and that allows you to really automate all these aspects of a business rather than you know, spend time setting up a meeting invite yourself and yeah. determining, hey, when's your, when are you free? Yeah, and it was definitely um, a learning experience when we were trying to pick these tools, like a kind of a diverge, converge type of mentality where there are so many shiny new objects that we wanted to try out and test out, and then eventually had to reduce a lot of that complexity and, and simplify it. So that was a huge list I, I just went through, but I'm sure we can still even make that more simple because complexity even in your tools can cause a lot of issues so we're still looking at how do we simplify that whole process okay Uh, i'd love you to show the audience marcel maybe two to three of your favorite tools and some of the big problems or the big tasks that they help execute for your business or or for your clients sure two to three of my favorite tools um and yeah, maybe so, you, can, you can screen share it. Maybe we can start off with, um, yeah, some, something you use for prospecting. Yeah, let's, uh, I'm trying to think. Yeah, so let me, uh, okay, so I'm going to just pull up my Zapier here real quick. No worries. And see what we got. Yeah, so right now what we're using for um, prospecting is a nice simple tool that, uh, you know, that we have in, uh, well, Zapier released a whole bunch of new features. One is their tables and their interfaces, um, which we are using to create a real nice, simple CRM system that essentially becomes our source of truth. So we use uh, like this data that is in the tables here, and I don't want to go into it because that's too much uh, of our some of our client and prospect information here. Definitely, let's not share that. <laughs> yeah, so it's a it's a bit of a, a, a very very simple table that lets us track our deals in different stages. And then we can push this data to other tools, whether it's uh, Vendasta's platform, uh, you know, Vendasta's built-in CRM, uh, ActiveCampaign, uh, wherever we need this data, this becomes our source of truth. And what's nice is the reason we did that was to reduce the complexity and to make things more simple. So having that information in one platform, like in, in Zapier, uh, since it's handling the automations, the data, and the interface of how you interact with it, if you're not familiar with interfaces, they kind of work like... Um, uh, web pages. So we build a lot of uh, funnel pages inside here and then manipulate the data in the table directly within Zapier uh, with the goal of just reducing any chance of error. Because once you have a whole bunch of things connected, the likelihood that one of those things breaks or you need to maintain it, just in, it just simply increases. So the idea was let's just keep this as simple from the start and then slowly build out over time once we know that the stuff is reliable and consistent. Okay. Now you also have an automation set for uh, the prospecting, the reporting of data and, and, and how a client's progress is going in their digital marketing and you use tools to record that as well. Can, can you walk us through that one? Uh, yeah, so then uh, with that one, so for example here, I'm just going to jump back into Vendasa here because there's two real big tools that we use. Uh, one, during our prospecting um, stage where we use Vendasa's built-in snapshot report to get, give us a general idea of where they stand across a few different dimensions. So in this particular um, 
account here, we're looking at their SEO, their social, their reviews, and their listings, or you know, like the digital signposts or directories that are pointing back to their their website here. Okay, and, and so for you, mm-hmm. this is giving them uh, this is like a health check for a, a prospect, right? How they're doing yeah. across. Yeah, that is okay. correct. So it's a good, it's a good health check. It gives me an understanding of what I'm walking into beforehand. Because the big thing that we want to do during the prospecting stage is identify where the client wants to go and what's the reality of the situation, and then show them what the gap is and what they need to do to get from where they are today to where they want to go. And the snapshot tool is really good for that. So if the client understands the the reality of the situation and that the gap they have to uh, that they have to cross here to get to where they want to go is really big. I might not pull this up, but sometimes this is really good to just support what we're talking about to really show them, you know, saying, Hey, your, your SEO is, you know, in this case at the time of the snapshot report, not great. Right. So you're, you're showing up, uh, not very high in certain regions and areas of the Chicago and area. There's a lot of opportunity here, especially compared to your, your, uh, competitors. And then I can show them that we have a process of how to get there. And it's a great tool, uh, to, you know, especially to remind, them, or I guess to remind myself on the sales side that I'm not trying to teach them anything here. I'm just trying to show them the process that we know how to do it, not not to actually teach them anything about SEO. Okay. And then and then what is what does the automation stack look like, if you will, to show them this data, to show them the the updates? What does your process in the stack look like? Yeah. So what's really cool is we actually use a lot of this data in the automation to reduce our uh, level of touch with our clients to minimize it as much as possible so that we could really stay focused on uh, so that our time that we actually spend one to one with clients is focused on actionable and practical next steps. So we went from having monthly calls to uh, you know like monthly one on one calls with clients where we walk through this executive report from top to bottom, answer every question, they would get distracted, want to dive deeper into things that really didn't matter to their goals to sending an automated or um, a, a recorded message three times a week. So we inc- actually increase the frequency of how often we communicate with our clients, but now it's recorded messages where we can actually go through here and say, Hey, your impressions are up. This is good. You know, engagement's a little bit down, but we're not too concerned for, you know, X, Y, Z reasons. And then given that, you know, there's uh, you know, uh, just four um, that the leads are down by four in 30 days, not a huge concern at this point, especially with the impressions being up. So, you know, overall things are, are looking pretty good. And then we can keep the conversation really focused at this point. And what that allows us then is then when we do jump on a call, um, in this case, now we talk to our clients once every six weeks to actually focus on what a, the real problems are. We can say highly focus on what that problem is, really focus on what the actions are that we need to take and put together a game plan of what needs to happen over the next six week period. Uh, so it's really helped create a lot of focus, accountability, and just allow us to do the things that we need to do to, to get the results that they're looking for without getting distracted. I love it. So this, this all gets automated. And then instead of having a client call, you send them a Loom video to walk them through the update. And that really fits in with this digital nomadic aspiration, this lifestyle that you, whether you're in Budapest or Brazil, you can do this from for anywhere. You don't need to go into yep. the cafe owner's shop that you're, you're, you're helping managing marketing for. <laughs> yeah, th- no, that is correct. We, we can do this fully remote. Uh, time zones don't matter at that point. We can schedule, you know, we can pre-record the meetings. We can schedule when the emails go out. So the email goes out during, you know, their business hours. Uh, so we can still keep everything uh, kosher in the sense that we have certain expectations of when we're available. And even though we might be working outside of those expectations because we're in a different time zone, they still get the communication in their their local time. Okay. Um, are you using ChatGPT for anything? Yeah. So we are using ChatGPT uh, quite a bit now, especially for uh, the content creation side of things. Um but right before I switch to that one, uh, we were actually just talking this week of how we can take some of our templates uh, that we were using to automate and, and send emails out to our clients and use ChatGPT to essentially draft them so there's some more variation in it instead of it just being the strict rigid template. So we're actually looking at building that into some of our automation processes to just even help this process here of when we're signing out these recordings. But then as far as our content right now, so uh, we're using ChatGPT to create both our um, client content and uh, we use that by focusing on what we call like these narrative maps. So we have a whole bunch of these narrative maps or copywriting formulas that we come up with to structure what the content is or what the output's going to look like. And this one here is just an example of um, especially you know, uh, focusing on our audience. So we, we work with a lot of law firms. And in this case, the narrative map here is something like when it comes to you know this variable, selling your legal services, who the audience is, so in the case, lawyers make this mistake of teaching too much. So this is the particular topic and obstacle that we're work, 
looking at. We'll use this to then, you know, uh, essentially build a prompt. So I'll just kind of show you guys this here. This is just a really long, as you can see, a really long, long prompt of, uh, of building a prompt. So the output of this exercise here is to ultimately get to a, a single prompt that we can use to uh, consistently create content. And what is this one? Oh, this is just uh, kind of showing like the output of it. Uh, yeah. Wow, you got plan content planned out for, for for days and weeks here. Yeah, so we so this is kind of like our content calendar. Uh, so we had about six months of content uh, produced and scheduled, and this is just just for us. Uh, and it's everything from recording two videos every every six weeks, uh, content going out daily. We have promotions going out. We have a workshop coming up, and I went and we don't use. I wouldn't, uh, so we don't use AI to just like run free. We use it to support ourselves and to essentially like what feels like giving ourselves superpowers, whether it's like Batman with his utility belt or Tony Stark with his suit. That's kind of the way that we're viewing AI is it's giving us additional powers to be even better than what we were before. Uh, that That is awesome, Marcel. Okay, you heard it here first, folks. Marcel is actually also willing to share his superpowers. So if you want Marcel's top three favorite AI prompts, please give this video a like. If we get to 500 likes, Marcel will be willing to share a template with his favorite AI prompts. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button and that notification bell so you get informed of more great content and interviews with folks like Marcel in the future. Okay, so Marcel, let's continue. So you've got, you've got an, what sounds like an amazing tech stack. And I think, uh, you know, typically an agency owner thinks about oh my God, each element of this tech stack, it costs me money, it increases complexity in my business. How do you, how do you manage that? How do you keep your tech stack simple and cost-effective enough? Uh, yeah, so there's definitely a kind of like a rapid experience, I'd say, instead of rapid development, rapid, rapid experience, so you can try this stuff out. Uh, always give, give myself uh, some test cases to take some of this technology through, so some windows of how long am I going to commit to it. So I was actually just using a, a new tool um, called... Oh geez, what's it called? It's called Opus, so that it can take uh, its AI can take long format video and chop it down to thirty second uh, sound bites. And I was like, you know, I have so many tools already, and so many video things going on that uh, I don't need another one. But it has a seven day trial, so I was like, oh yeah, I have seven days to run this through the gambit and see if I, it will do what I want to do. Um, and we kind of take that approach with with all the tools we're doing is, you know, depending on the level of impact that we think that tool will have and the complexity of what it's doing is giving it us, uh, you know, thinking of what is the outcome, what's the impact that we want to do, and let's run it through that test and, and see how far we can take it. And it's definitely something I wish I had, you know, done sooner, for sure, because there's tools that I feel we are kind of stuck in and are very difficult to migrate out of. So, for example, um, not saying that we would leave our current project management tool, but if we did, it is kind of a nightmare. Like, there's so many really cool ones out there right now, um, like ClickUp and SmartSuite and a whole bunch of other really neat stuff uh, that look enticing, but it's a big pain in the butt to try and move something like that. So it's always good to you know be mindful and, and test things out uh, as thoroughly as you can in a in a, a short amount of time. So Marcel, within this whole infrastructure you have for your agency, what what do the humans do? So if you and your wife are focusing on the clients, the operations, the strategy, the big picture, who's coming in to do the fulfillment? How do we fulfill these services? Is first, is there a tool that will just do it? So we're looking at automation, AI, some sort of platform. If not, then we look at uh, a professional vendor, someone who might specialize in that particular service. And then we look at, okay, well, um, who needs to oversee that vendor? Can our VA oversee or, or help operate or support that vendor? And then if not, then, then it's finally us uh, or either uh, Gabby or, or myself doing it. So then ideally, it minimizes the number of people that we have to lead or communicate with or, or, or manage. So you know, now most of our meetings are uh, almost... Uh, well, we have um, meetings with our VAs every other day. Then we usually talk to our vendors once a month. And and really, the maintenance on the automations and AI is pretty minimal for the, the automated type of stuff, uh, not not including the like the one-off usages or when we actually need to jump in AI to use it for the stuff that, that we are responsible for. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I guess one concern that emerges from clients in this um, proliferation of AI use is quality yeah. assurance. How do you manage that? Yeah, so very rarely do we ever let AI just go live. So there's always some sort of checks and balance in, in the process. 
And the idea is that you want to minimize results by reducing complexity and reducing the, what you call like coupling or the time in between events. So if we know that we're going to have AI do something or produce some content, it usually goes into a draft state. Uh, someone can then uh, QC it. So we build that QC time into it. Um, and typically at this point, a lot of that stuff is QC'd uh, by our VAs. So we uh, work and coach them on what does ideal look like. So what is the perfect thing they're striving to so that they can actually see it so they can do it in bulk. And usually that process alone takes, you know, a, a week or 30 days to get get someone up to the process of what does ideal look like so that we know that they can do it on their own. Um, and, and so that that's really where how we use uh, AI is mostly pointing to the draft states, building the processes, training our support, uh, our, our support team to be able to QC it uh, on their own. And then if there's ever something where the support team is Drafting something, then then I you know, it would be either myself or Gabby would be the ones that are are QCing it, and usually the process is pretty minimal, especially after you get through that introductory period of uh, of training. So you know, I run my own content agency, and I thought QCing or quality controlling it would would come to me as the business owner at the end. That's what I do with my subcontractors. But you've gotten to a stage where, with your hundred percent execution free business model, you've taught VAs how to do that. You've taught support people how to do that. But like, how? That's amazing. It, yeah, uh, the biggest thing is that um, it came back from uh, my days before I ran, ran my own agency. I had a, a painting company, and there's this concept I came, uh, that I came across called uh, Duragi. It, it stands for demonstrate, then observe, then uh, then redemonstrate, then you assign a goal, and then you inspect. And you kind of run through that process over and over again each time you introduce something new to someone that you are managing or leading, especially if it's a task on like what does ideal look like and what, what's the goal. So we always uh, assume that if we're going to introduce something new, which also kind of helps us be more selective that if we're going to introduce something new, it's going to be our time and responsibility to train that person. And we need to uh, be realistic with it that if we don't do that, then the quality of it's, of course, going to be not necessarily good, but it's going to be inconsistent. Like we don't know what it's going to be uh, or it could be lucky, right, if, if it does come out good. But we want to be better than lucky. We want to be certain that it's going to be the quality that we expect it to be. Okay. How has this transition to 100% execution-free agency business model changed your growth outlook, changed your, your profits, efficiency, margins? How, how's, what's the impact it had, had, it's had on your financials? Uh, yeah, so it's been fantastic because we know we can scale. Uh, capacity is not uh, a huge issue. Uh, uh, it's definitely reduced the time we need to spend on execution free side things from you know from doing the work to managing the work so you know the whole the the age old adage of you know working in the business versus working on the business we're definitely working on the business now and we're you know on track to have our biggest year ever we're selling bigger projects than we've ever sold before um, you know we've pretty much increased our monthly charge rate by uh, 3x uh, in a very in about a six, a six month period and it wouldn't have been possible without these systems, these tools, you know, really focusing on how to be more execution free uh, and doing everything we could to take ourselves out of the business. And I'd say it's, it's almost like a constant, uh, a constant journey. Cause every time we think we've removed something, we find something else that we could remove. Right. So it's like, I feel execution free now, but then next time I'm like, Oh, I could actually stop doing this. I don't have to do this thing anymore. And just keep looking for these opportunities to keep removing ourselves from, from the business as much as possible. Ultimately, maybe to one point where I can, hire president and then not even have to do any of this stuff. <laughs> wow. Okay. I, I think you heard it here, folks. So less time intensive, more profitable, more capacity, more lifestyle. Yes. Yeah. The goal is to build a, that lifestyle <laughs> empire, right? That's uh, what we, we, what we focus on, the people we work with. We want them to be focusing on that too, uh, especially that's why we work with a lot of professional services because they, they feel like they get stuck in that, that rut also where they, they went into their business or they went, they started their own business for freedom, but then they become essentially stuck in it or a, a prisoner to it. And they realize, how do I get out of this? Like what, what I do? And you know, it's like, well, you got to focus on that, that delivery service. How do you simplify it? How do you keep taking yourself out of it and looking for those opportunities? That's incredible. Okay. So you mentioned three Xing your, your rates and how this model has enabled you to drastically increase your price, your, increase your pricing. Uh, can you, can you talk to us about that? How, how do you price and package your services? It, yeah, so uh, I had a buddy tell me once that the best, the biggest thing that he had learned was, or the most impactful thing he had learned was simplifying his services down to one package. 
And at the time, I was like, how the hell you do that in marketing? Like, there's all these different things you do. I was like, there's no way we'd ever get to it. And it probably took me about a year until I saw how you, like, until I kind of had this aha moment on how to do it. And what we do is we built a all-inclusive package that attracts people by addressing their immediate want or frustration that they're dealing with, like, right now and say, you know, Want, you know, something that we could help them with in the first day, seven days, 30 days, or 90 days. But then we actually sell them on the idea of what's coming down the road, you know, in one year, three years from now. And that's because we actually built our services as a, a program. It's something that, hey, first we do this in the fir- first 30 days, then the next six months we do this. Then lastly, we, we you know, focus on how do we scale. And that started by, you know, focusing on solving one small problem at a time. And then eventually it's stacked into going, hey, we know we can actually deliver all this and it's a roadmap and showing them that we have a process of going from day one to you know day 365 and beyond. Let's talk a bit about prospecting. So, you know, you're getting to travel, you're getting to go around the world uh, as part of this lifestyle empire. How do you also make sure um, uh, uh, that you're, you keep getting good new clients? Yeah. So similar to like our conversation with all of our clients, it comes down to messaging, right? So we have to start with what is our message? Who is our market? Where are these things overlap? That's that's going to be our niche. And then how do we focus on creating consistency of that content over and over again to, to attract them? So the three big things we always focus on is how do we attract new clients, how do we convert them, and then how do we deliver our services. And that's the, that's the exact same model we, we sell to our clients is helping them attract, convert, and deliver. So when we what that looks like is building essentially an appointment engine. And, and I heard this from uh, you know one of the coaching programs uh, that we're part of is building this system so that it ultimately runs uh, without your involvement as much as possible. And one of the big um, components of that is to bring it down to as few steps as possible. So it's a two-step process. It's, hey, we need someone to raise their hand. So a stranger that says they're interested, they get into our funnel. Then they go into a 15-minute uh, qualifying call where we just find out, hey, if, are they the client? Uh, are they going to be a good client? Do we have a problem that they can actually solve? Then from there, uh, we, we move them over. Uh, so now once they commit with time, they'll go into our what we call our strategy session, which is a 45 minute to 60 minute conversation. And then ultimately, uh, they'll commit with time or commit with uh, money and become a client. And the whole point that is the, the qualifying call is where we start to set the expectations. We have identified that they are client and we start to change the tone of they're now auditioning for us. Like we know we have the solution that they need. And if that's the case, there's no reason for us to be chasing them. It's just we need to get them caught up to, to see that too. And that's what the strategy session is, is to show them that we have the solution and they actually want it or need it. So they're reaching out to you and auditioning for your services. Yeah, that's that's the, I'd say that is the goal, right? It's um it's a constant thing that you, like you're always tempted to, especially when you have like a really good client in front of you to want to go after them. But it's remembering that after that qualifying call, we've identified that, yes, they need help. So like looking at that, that snapshot report of seeing, hey, where's their SEO? We know we can fix that. There's no reason we need to chase them now because we, we have the solution that they need. Well, that's incre- incredible. I, I, I'm definitely going to try and have some of your minds, <laughs> mindset for my own future prospecting. Um, tell us about the time you, were, you weren't you were 100% execution free. You've noticed how this completely transformed your, your lifestyle. You've got this lifestyle empire. What was the what was the pre um, lifestyle empire days like? It, yeah, it um it was stressful, right? Like it, it was uncertain. Uh, I felt like I was like I had a lot of doubts of can I do this for the next ten years or twenty years from now? You know, I'm I'm, I'm getting older. My wife and I are married. We're talking about having a family. I was like, how could I possibly do all these things at one time? I was like, there's there's no way because it was uh there it was just too much to do. I felt like uh it, like. Again, how most of our clients feel where they're spilling, spinning all those plates. You know, uh, you feel like you're drinking water from a fire hose. Uh, it, it was just, it was intense, right? And uh, that went on for you know quite some time until we really started focusing on and taking it seriously how to remove ourselves from the business. Uh, what is the best use of our time? How to value our own value and and put emphasis on that. Okay, and and Marcel, you know, from my experience in talking to the to to many other agency owners, this is ex- that's exactly it. What you said yeah. right there. They are so knee deep in the work. Uh, we've got people in our own Facebook community saying there's just not enough hours in the day. They're the first to wake up in their family. They feed yeah. their families, then they sleep at 2 a.m. Then they wake up at 5 a.m. Uh, to, to, to keep doing stuff. So, uh, and you sound like you've, you've finally, you've managed to break out of that rut. So 
how what what would your advice be to other agency owners who are stuck there? They're it, stuck in that. Yeah, I, I'd say the first thing is it, it's definitely mindset, right? Like it's it sounds so silly, and for the longest time I was like, yeah, okay, sure, like whatever. But like, what do I gotta do? It's like, well, that's the first step, right? Like the first the first step is you, you gotta look at the mindset and be like. There's only 24 hours in a day. Everyone deals with that, no matter you know, what the situation is. So that's that's just the reality of it. So then the next thing is, what that means is, the stuff you commit to is what's going to grow. If you commit to catching other people's crap, that's what's going to happen. You're going to catch more people's crap. <laughs> so like, how, so just be mindful of what you're committing to that it isn't going to move the business forward. And then after that, it's going okay. Well, what are the constraints in the business? What's the thing that I need to focus in right now? And just keep slowly digging yourself out by just doing one small tweak after another. Uh, having a really clear goal of where you want the business. So if you're thinking, hey, I want to be execution free, that's great. But that might be a year, that might be three years from now. That's that's okay. It's what is the stuff that you need to do in the next six weeks and just staying really focused on it. So it might be, hey, know that your value is uh, something. So value your own value. Don't catch other people's crap. And then just stay focused on the things that are practical and they're going to move your business forward today and next week. Because um, again, I, you know, I, I do a lot of uh, coaching programs. I, t I talk to a lot of uh, different agencies. You know, people uh, attend a lot of workshops. And one of them was, um, what was it? It was, yeah, somebody along the lines, like if, you, if you're spending three or four hours on your business today and it's not moving forward, you're just simply doing the wrong work, right? It's, you're, you're just, you're, you just are. You're not, you're not doing the things that are going to move your business forward. And it's figuring out what you got cut out of your day so that, those three or four hours that you do spend on your business actually do move it forward. Okay. So Marcel, all that's fantastic from a mindset perspective. If you could go back in time when you founded Little Jack Marketing and of, and of course Gabby came into the picture, uh, were there any um, other things or tools you would have implemented right from the start to get to that execution-free stage even, even um, uh, quicker in concurrent with that mindset? Yeah. yeah, so I'd say the first thing is uh, if you want to talk about what tools to use, it starts with, well, what problems are you solving? And then when you're talking about what problems are you solving, well, it's who, who are you helping? So the thing I would have done first was really focus on finding my niche, like finding out who we work best, best with, who who are the people that when I have a conversation with, I'm a superhero too, right? So like th those people where it's like, sure, um, you know, we might be able to help everyone. And that was a mentality for a while. It's like, I can help all small businesses, but there's a, you know, a few people, a certain mentality or a certain group or, you know, specific industries that it's like, when I get in front of them, things just like really, uh, really spark and are really good. So we'll spend more time to uh, find that level of confidence to commit to a specific uh, market and a specific message to then go, okay, well, well, now what tools do I need to support that? What's gonna help me get results faster, help them, you know, make it look like what we do is a magic trick and, you know, get these results as quickly as possible for them to build these long-term relationships. Uh, the other thing I would been, you know, really focus on doing is to stop doing um, everything yourself. There's just way too many tools, too much support, uh, too many resources with you know VAs and other platforms to help uh, help give you more power and essentially duplicate yourself as a you know uh, as as the the business owner. And then really focus on spending time developing the people you do communicate with. So like that uh, example I gave of uh, Duragi, where it's you know demonstrate, observe, redemonstrate, assign a goal, and inspect. Like that's just that's just the part of the role of being the business owner is you you gotta spend time with your people, develop them, help help them understand what the outcome is, what the impact of them doing is, and and really really uh, grow it from there. Okay, and just to wrap things up, um, where do you see the future of agencies going with the proliferation of AI, and will AI make um, it harder to hold on to, to to clients or make it easier to hold on to clients? Yeah, I think um, what's really, really cool about AI for us, especially since we spend so much time on messaging and copywriting and content and, and strategy, is it's allowing us to do that stuff more consistently and faster. Uh, it's way easier to go from a blank page to, to first draft really quick. And then you can take that first draft and then get on brand or on point a lot, a lot faster too. So if anything, it's just going to keep empowering us. And I think it's going to force the agency owners or the individuals to kind of get back to basics. So like get back to your understanding of, um, you know, from a marketing standpoint, like the, the psychology, the behaviors, like just really understanding what's going on. So you can actually spend more time uh, just getting more educated so that you can then create those prompts and tell the AI what to do or know what to look for or what, what, what a ideal or good outcome looks like. Um, Cause what I found is when I first started using uh, AI, I was like, man, most of this stuff that it, pops out for social media, for emails, for blog posts, is just, it's garbage. It's just really bad. And the reason for that is 
there's a lot of really bad marketing out there, right? You just got, got to say it. And AI is trained on that bad marketing. So if you want it to be better and more specific to you or to have your voice, you got to really understand what you're putting into it, what you're seeding it with, how, what are the frameworks and the structures you're, you're giving it to get that good marketing that is uniquely you and your experience. So if anything, it's just going to make us uh, better at what we, what we do. More superpowers. Yeah, more superpowers. All right, wonderful. Marcel, this was an absolute treasure trove of insights for both myself and the audience. I just want to thank you so much. And I also want to thank Gabby so much. Uh, congratulations to you both on building this lifestyle empire and uh, for you both uh, for, for, for feeding uh, all these great insights to our audience. Really appreciate your time. Oh, for sure. Thank you for having me. It was fantastic. And yeah, the, uh, my door is always open for anyone that has any questions. I'm happy to, to chat. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Marcel.